Good morning. I want to begin this morning with a prayer, a prayer for Father's Day. Maybe you are like me, and the way, the first way that I understood the love of God was through the love of my father. My uh, father was, was a deacon and uh, just uh, a man devoted to, it is still a man devoted to God. Uh, and so that's how I first learned what the love of God looked like. You may not be like me, uh, and your father may not have been that example of the love of God. But you may have had other men who filled that role in your life, the spiritual fatherhood, uh, a teacher, a coach, um, someone at church, a grandfather. Uh, there are God has blessed us. He prom Jesus promised his disciples. Uh, they were concerned. They said, we've left everything to follow you. And he told them, because you have followed me, you will receive more than you've ever left, uh, including family members. Uh, and so God has, has blessed me, not just with an earthly father, but with also other men in my life who have shown me what it looks like to follow Christ. Uh, and so uh, I encourage you, if your earthly father was not that for you, then think of, of Father's Day as a time to be thankful for those men who have stepped into that role and been a father figure for you, especially a father figure who has helped you to understand the love of God the Father. He ultimately is father. Uh, he ultimately is all of our fathers. And so this morning I want to pray uh, for those of us who Father's Day is a day of joy and those of us who Father's Day is a, a challenge. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. I thank you, God, for the gift of life, and we thank you for our fathers who uh, helped to give us life. Heavenly Father, I thank you for uh, those, all those, God, who have led us to help understand what it means for you to be our Father, who have shown us love, who have shown us compassion, who have shown us forgiveness, who have shown us grace, who have held us when we have hurt, who have encouraged us when we have fallen. God, whether that is our earthly father or whether that is someone else who has filled that role for us, I thank you for those men who have been that for us in our lives. Heavenly Father, I pray uh, this day for fathers. I pray for those, Lord, with children of their own or those who have stepped into that role, uh, for children who need that father figure. And I pray for your blessing on them, that you would help them to follow you. And as they follow you and learn fatherhood from you, that they would be good fathers to their children, God, and to those who are looking up to them. Heavenly Father, thank you for the ways that you bless us. And God, we ask for comfort today for those which this day is difficult, uh, those who have uh, lost their fathers, whose fathers have passed away, those who may not know their fathers or know their fathers well, uh, those, who, those whose fathers have been the opposite of the kind of father that you are. Uh, and pray God, we pray God today for comfort for those who um, have had difficult relationships with their fathers, God, and we pray uh, for those men who have stepped into that role and been the kind of father that you are. And we thank you for them, God, and pray your blessing on them. Thank you for this day, God. Be with us now as we open your word and help us to hear from you. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to jump right in today to Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 8. And then we'll take a little closer look at some details. Romans 5. 1 through 8. Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Rome, says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we exult in the hope of the glory of God. Not only this, we also exult in our tribulations knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance proven character, and proven character hope. And hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. There is not a secret code to the Bible. And we have talked about this in our Wednesday night Bible studies. Um, the Bible does not have secret knowledge 
that is waiting to be uncovered. Uh, we are not Gnostics. You know what Gnostics are? The Gnostics were an early heresy of Christianity that said that there were levels that you achieved. That you first knew God and then as you knew more, as you, as you attained more knowledge, that you became more and more like God. Uh, and that there was secret knowledge that only the, only the high achievers uh, could get. We're not Gnostics and we're also not a cult. A good way to tell if you're in a, a, a church or a cult is are there levels of achievement? Uh, are there levels of knowledge? Are there things they haven't told you yet because you have not achieved a certain level? either by giving or by uh, being, being trusted with the secrets. Church, real churches aren't like that. Everything that we know is available. Everything that we believe is available here in the Word of God. We're, there's not a secret code. There are not levels of knowledge. But there are some things in the Bible that you can say, okay, this seems to be sort of a next level thing. <laughs> there are some things that are, you can understand on the face of it but you realize, I still have a ways to go before I really grapple with this. And verses 3 through 5 have been that for me for the past several years. Uh, just for example, Paul says in verse 3, We exult in our tribulations. And if you're like me, you might say, Really? Our tribulations? Exult means celebrate. Exult means get, get loud and get excited about it. And I say, Really? Exult in my tribulations. And then at the very beginning of verse 5, Paul says, hope does not disappoint. And again, I want to say, are you sure? Because the first thing, exult in our tribulations, that seems beyond me. That seems more than what I'm capable of, or at least more than what I've been capable of up to this point in my life. And the second, hope does not disappoint. Well, that seems to be proved untrue just by my life experience. I have had hopes that were disappointed. I have had things that I hoped would happen that didn't happen or that haven't happened. That's why it's important to put things in context. And Romans 5, 1 through 8, and particularly that latter part of verse 5 all the way through verse 8, puts this in a different perspective. So first of all, a reminder. If you read the Apostle Paul, it's not like reading a devotional thought for the day. Uh, Paul writes dense. Uh, he, he writes carefully structured arguments. He builds on what he's writing. And he often talks about several things at once and refers back to things, even in the Old Testament, that you sort of have to wrap your whole head around. And what we just did was jump into chapter 5 of his most carefully constructed letter. He's been building this for a while, and he has ways to go yet after this part of the argument. So he writes dense. So here's what we need to grapple with, first of all, is that Paul is not using general feel-good terms. Uh, Paul, is not, uh, Paul is not giving us um, fodder for motivational posters with little kittens hanging on a, a tree branch. Just hang in there. That's not Paul's goal. He's got bigger fish to fry. So when he says faith and peace and grace and the glory of God and perseverance and character and hope and love, He's not just using words that sound good. This is a man who is already devoted to God, uh, who already believed that he was giving his life to what God wanted, and then he met Jesus alive on the road and found out that God still wanted his devotion, but in a very different way from what he had expected. He found out that God still had a plan for the world, but it was a very different plan than the plan that he had originally had in mind, and he thought he was doing when he was persecuting Christians. Meeting Jesus alive on the road changed everything for Paul. And Paul is writing uh, the book of Romans to a church he hasn't been to yet. He knows a lot of people there. A lot of Paul's letters are written to churches that he started. And so he's writing to check in on them. He's writing to give them advice. He's writing to encourage them. But this is a church that he hasn't been to yet. And he's sort of explaining everything that he believes. Um, there's a reason that Romans is the book that we turn to most often to explain how to be saved is because Paul is really laying out here's what I believe to be true about Christianity and Paul is writing to shocked Jews and Paul is writing to skeptical Romans who have really just started Christianity they have stepped onto the shore of a new continent uh, the Jews would have believed one thing about God the, the, the Romans would have believed Another thing about God, one God among many, and Paul is writing to both of these groups 
and saying, actually, there's a third thing <laughs> that God is doing. God is creating one family. And all these things that Paul mentions, faith and peace and grace, the glory of God, perseverance, character, hope and love, all of those things would have been understandable to Jewish people. They would have known, at least had some concept of what Paul was talking about. They would have meant another thing to Gentiles who would have understood them in another way. But now they mean a whole new thing based on what Jesus has done and based on who Jesus is. Faith and peace and grace and the glory of God, perseverance and character and hope and love are amplified and transformed based on what Jesus Christ has done. So they've stepped onto a new continent. We're exploring new territory in Paul with Rome, uh, in Paul writing to the Romans, and it still means that for us. So let's look at these verses in a little bit of detail and talk about what is Paul talking about when he uses these words. 5.1 Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Justified by faith. That's a legal term. It means that God has brought the gavel down and declared us not guilty. Not because we weren't guilty, <laughs> but because of our faith in Jesus Christ. Because we have believed in Him. It means our verdict has changed. We have received a plea bargain. We have received mercy. We have received what we, we have, mercy is when you don't get what you deserve. Grace is when you get what you don't deserve. And we've received both because of faith in Jesus Christ. Because of what Jesus has done, it changes us and it changes God's verdict on us. We've been justified. It's an anticipation of the final verdict. When we stand before God and God to, to declare us whether we have been what he created us to be or not, the, vi the final verdict will come down. And Paul says if we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we know what the final verdict will be. God will declare us not guilty because of our faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the judge. Paul is very clear about that in the New Testament. The Old Testament is clear about that. The Son of Man is the judge of the world. And if we put our faith in Him, we're with Him. And He declares us not guilty. Everybody go, phew, <laughs> that's good news. Declared not guilty and given peace with God. That's one of those words that, you know, it's nice to, how many of you have something, something in your house or on a keychain or on a t-shirt that says peace? And it has a symbol on it, maybe. Maybe it's tie-dye. Some of you old, some of you old, some of you older people may have a tie-dyed something or other that says peace on it. Uh, I don't see any Volkswagen bugs out there in the, the uh, but you, you know, we, that's, it's one of those terms that's been sort of watered down. But Paul means something very specific. He's talking about peace with God. Eugene Peterson said, peace is not just an absence. It's not just when, when nothing bad is happening. Peace is a presence. Peace with God. Where God is, there is peace. Where God is, when God's will is done, that's peace. Um, there's a great, one of my favorite uh, theologians, his name is Jürgen Moltmann. Isn't that a good name for a theologian? Jürgen Moltmann. Bob Smith may be a good theologian, but he's never going to be a great theologian because he doesn't have a name like Jürgen Moltmann. Moltmann said about peace, and this is one of those things that I read a couple of years ago and it just kind of clicked and made, made the whole thing make sense for me. God's crowning achievement of creation was not the creation of humanity. Genesis 1 tells the story of God's creation and God declared it all very good, but, but the creation of humanity is not God's crowning achievement. Although we're pretty great, even according to Psalm 8, a little lower than the angels, the crowning achievement of God's creation is when God rests and all is at peace. Peace and everything the way it's supposed to be is God's crowning achievement. That's what the Jewish people still mean when they say shalom. It means may things be the way God wants them to be. And peace with God, we have found that. Things are the way God wants them to be with us and Him when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. All is well, we might say. Martin Luther King Jr. said, peace is not just the absence of war, but the presence of justice, where things are done the way God wants them done. That's what justice is. All of that is wrapped up in peace. And there's another little angle to this too. N.T. Wright pointed out that peace was what the Roman Empire promised. As the centurions marched in in front of their armies, they said, congratulations, we've come to bring you peace. And if you don't want it, we'll kill you. That's what the Roman Empire did. And so there's the peace that the world offers. That's what Jesus was talking about. We talked about this last week. Not peace like the world gives, but real peace I offer to you. What God wants done. 
not just when the people in charge have everything the way they like it and call it peace, but when God has everything the way he likes it, that's peace. And we have that with him in Jesus Christ. But wait, there's more. Verse 2. Through whom? Through Jesus Christ. Also, we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we exult in hope of the glory of God. Obtained our introduction. We've, I know we've talked about this before. How many of you are people that can talk your way into places that you don't really belong? How, who would admit that? How many of you are married to someone that can talk their way into places where they don't really belong? No one's, aha! She's calling you out, Daryl. Um, I have a good friend who can talk his way into places. He'll tell me about things that, that he's done. I'm like, how did you get in there? And he'll shrug. He just has a way of getting into places where he doesn't belong. But this is legit. This is when you, where you really do belong there. You have the credentials. You have the introduction. You have, you're on the list. And you really can go in. Uh, and there's all sorts of different kinds of access. I told you once before about um, <laughs> the, the same friend. He's a photographer, and so he was taking pictures of people uh, at a concert. And they had paid extra. That's how they had obtained their introduction. They had, a, they had paid extra to, be, to have pictures taken with a particular person. I'm not going to tell you exactly who the person was, but he's a member of the Beatles, and his name rhymes with bingo. Uh, and so they went to this concert, and if you paid, you know, you could have your picture taken with this man. Uh, now this man would hug women, and you know, he could give you a, you, you could get, if you were a woman, you could give him a hug. If you were a man, you could touch elbows with him. He didn't do handshakes, he didn't do fist bumps, he didn't do high fives, just touching elbows. So there's access, but even that, even paying extra only gets you an elbow bump. That's as close as you can get. Um, some people have compared that. There's a, a singer named Rihanna. Rihanna is not like that. Rihanna likes to, to really hang on people. And it, uh, some people have taken pictures of Rihanna like jumping on their back as they've paid extra to take pictures with her and she uh, rides them piggyback. Uh, so there's different levels of access. It depends on uh, how willing the person is to have you come to them. And the access that we have with God is that introduction by faith, by th this grace in which we stand. We can come close to Him. As the book of Hebrews says, to approach boldly to the throne of grace. Who can approach boldly to the throne? Think about someone seated on a throne. They're the one in charge. Who has the right to come up boldly to the throne? Children, right? The child of the king has the right. No one's going to you know, if, if, the, if a toddler escapes, the, 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 the king's child escapes and runs up to the throne, no one's going to get too mad at that child. We have that access. We have that right. Access is a temple image. Uh, we have that introduction. We have the credentials to get past this level. The way the, the temple in Jerusalem was built, and all the ancient temples were like this, was that you had to have the right credentials to get close to the shrine. In the Jerusalem temple, if you wanted to get close to the holy place, the Gentiles, people who weren't Jewish, they stayed in the outer court. You could come in to the temple, but you couldn't come all the way in. You could stay in the foyer if you wanted to worship in the temple. Jewish women could come into the next court. Jewish men could come in further than that. The priests could come in further than that where the sacrifices were offered. And the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies one day a year. You had to have the right credentials even to get that access. But everything has changed because of faith in Jesus Christ. Because we stand with Him, the one who, the one who deserves, the one who is the Holy of Holies. And He's with us. We're with Him. We have access and an introduction based on our identity with Him. And what we receive in that, we exult in the hope of the glory of God. It's not just a random term that Paul is, is throwing out. What he has in mind here when he talks about the glory of God is God's purpose fulfilled. And we find out in what uh, other places where Paul uh, teaches, including Romans chapter 8, the glory of God is a restored humanity in a restored creation. What God originally intended but magnified. God created us in His image. God created us to have a relationship with Him and relationship to the world around us. And God's glory is to have that done. <laughs> is to have his purpose fulfilled in us and in the world. Grown up, Paul says, uh, growing up in him, grown up humanity, reflecting the image of God. There's one glory that parents have when their ch children are little, and people say, oh, how cute. It's another glory when parents have grown up children who have achieved something. 
It reflects something about the parent and the way that they raised them. That's what Paul has in mind, is grown up, grown up Christians, doing what God has called them to do, being where God has placed them to be. Restored humanity and a restored creation. That's the glory of God, is God's purpose fulfilled in us. So with that in mind, then we switch over to the one where we say, really? We exult in our tribulations. How many of you have problems you are not sure how to solve? Raise your hand. <laughs> okay. Some of y'all are feeling pretty good. And now seriously, <laughs> how many of you have problems that you're not sure how to solve? If that's you, high five your neighbor right now. Yes, I've got problems and I don't know how to solve them. Woo! What in the world would make us say that about problems we don't know how to solve, about our tribulations? Why? Because God's goal is grown-up humanity, grown up into the image of Christ. Christians looking like Jesus is God's goal. And what do you need to do that? What do you need to grow up? People who study such things tell us that one of the main things you need is perseverance. You need to pick yourself up or you need to get up when you fall down. Uh, you need to, to not give up when you fail. Uh, you need to create that character that says, even if this doesn't work, I'm not going to give up. Not giving up creates character in you. That's what Paul is talking about. We exult in our tribulations because our tribulations teach us perseverance. Perseverance forms our character. And that character brings hope because we can see that God is doing what he is trying to do in our life when we persevere, when we believe in him, when we trust him, when we believe that he will do what he said he's going to do. Grace, these things, grace and patience and hope and love for people who are not like you, these were not pagan virtues. So Paul is writing to the church in Rome and the Roman Empire was not built on grace and patience and hope and love for people not like them. It was built on something else. These were not pagan virtues. They were Jewish virtues. They were things that people, the Jewish people understood about God based on the character of God and now based on the character of God revealed in Jesus. Uh, perseverance, patience, grace, hope, love for those unlike you. Oh yeah, that's God. That's the kind of character that's being created in us. Oh yeah, that's Jesus. That's the kind of character being created in us. The reason we can celebrate even, bizarrely, in our tribulation is because God uses those things to create in us who we were supposed to be, to make us like Christ, which is what we were made to be. They learned this, the Jewish people learned this about God, learned his perseverance because of his perseverance with Israel, that he, kept, that he, he didn't give up on them, uh, that he continued with them, that he didn't give up on them when they failed. Uh, Jesus persevered in the face of temptation. Jesus persevered in the face of trial. We learn this from God, and we learn this from Jesus Christ. That's why, in verse 5, hope does not disappoint. And then I love this next part. Because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. This is a verse that makes Bible scholars have polite fights with each other. Have you ever seen a polite fight? Uh, people are, are disagreeing about what is what, and they don't want to. They don't want to call each other names, but they. You can kind of tell that they sort of do. Uh, this is a, a verse that makes Bible scholars have polite fights. Does this mean the love of God has been poured out in our hearts? Does it mean the love God has for us, or does it mean the love we have for God? What kind of love has been poured out in our hearts? To that, I want to ask this question: Por qué no los dos? Do you remember that commercial? There's an old El Paso taco commercial several years ago where the family was uh, fighting over whether to have soft tacos or hard tacos. And then this very cute little girl said, Por qué no los dos? Why don't we have both? Uh, and then the, then the next scene is them lifting them up, lifting her up on their shoulders and celebrating. And then you can buy soft shells and hard shells in the same old El Paso taco thing. Uh, why don't we have both? Why not the love that God has for us and the love that we have for God? Because our ability to love is only possible because God loves us. That's where love comes from, is from Him. The love of God, the love we have for Him, the love He has for us, has been poured out in our hearts. That refers back to Pentecost and the prophecy of Joel. Well, I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. And when the Spirit gets poured out, we receive the love of God. We know it. 
the love of God, and we love God in return. And there it is, the Trinity. The word Trinity never appears in the Bible, but especially the Apostle Paul can't go more than five or ten verses without talking about the Trinity. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit at work in us. God's love is poured out in our hearts. The heart in the Bible is the seed of our motivation. Um, we might say, you know, our soul. It's not just our, 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 our mind, uh, not just our will, but all of us. The love of God fills every part of us, changes us, transforms us by the Spirit in the deepest part of ourselves. This is what God is up to in your life, is transforming you in the deepest part of ourselves in ways we may not even be aware of. God is transforming us. And God pours out His Spirit to do that. Have you ever seen the toddler pour juice? They get the cup, they get the juice thing, they pour. How does that usually go? Yeah, it depends on how clean you are. Uh, so they, they get some in the cup, but they also get some everywhere else. I think that's the way God pours out His Spirit. I think God, I think God doesn't measure like a scientist. I think God pours out His Spirit like a toddler. Just woo! Just Spirit, it's the love of God. There's plenty to go around. And God is not concerned about overflow. In fact, I think God wants there to be overflow. I think He wants us to know His love, and I think He wants that love to overflow to other people. I'm basing that on the love of Jesus that we see reflected in Him. God's love is poured out in our hearts. God is shaping us in love. That's how, why we, result, we exult, celebrate in our tribulations. I don't think that that means that all the tribulations that happen to us are things that God causes. I think that some of, the, some, of the, some of the trouble we have is based on the consequences of our sin. We've been declared not guilty, but that doesn't always mean that we escape the consequences of what we've done, especially on earth. It means we will eternally. There's grace and mercy there. But we have to deal with the consequences of, of what we do. Uh, just as a, a one example, if you're a person with a temper, you know, uh, and you put your faith in Jesus, God is working on you to help you control your anger, but you still have to deal with the consequences of when you blow up. Uh, and in those tribulations that, but in those tribulations that come about, even because of the consequences of what we have done, even there, God is shaping us and transforming us by his love. Uh, sometimes it's consequences of what we've done. Sometimes it's consequences of what other people have done to us. Sometimes it's, I think, it's just things that happen. But even in those situations in which we can't pinpoint a reason, whatever situation it is that causes us trouble, that gives us a problem that we can't solve in any of those situations, God is working to transform our character into the character of Christ through His love, because of His love. Every parent has experienced that moment when your child hurts, but you know the pain is necessary for something better. This is a hard thing to believe about God. We would like our belief in God to be convenient for us. <laughs> and we would like our belief in God to mean that things are going to be easy for us. But God does not promise that. What he promises is to transform us into the character of Christ. What he promises is to make us grown-up Christians in a restored world. And, they're going to, and basically, he promises that there are going to be hard times getting there. But I think it's helpful to remember that, that even on earth, every parent has experienced that moment when your child hurts, but you know that pain is necessary for them to get something better. Um, when, uh, what, what, uh, I was, we were all sleep deprived at this time. So what age do you first take little babies to go get their, their first shots? Is it two months? Six weeks. How many of you have been in the room when a six-week-old baby got their, got their shots in their foot? Oh, it's heartbreaking. But it's better to get a shot than it is to get measles. Uh, that moment of pain is better than the consequence of what would happen if that moment of pain was not there. And it's, we understand that on earth. Why do we not believe that God does that in our life too? Is it because the hurts are harder? Is it because the problems are bigger? Well, so is God. So is his love. So is his power to transform even the worst situations into something that gives glory to him. So is his power to transform even the hardest things in our life into something that makes us more like Christ. And this is the truth of this message, is that whatever the hardest thing in your life is, that's the place where God wants to transform you into most like Christ. I, don't, I do not say that God has caused that, but I am saying to you that whatever the hardest thing in your life is, that's where God is most at work to make you most like Christ.
The next verses give us, in case that is too difficult to believe, God then gives, a, or uh, Paul then gives us an example. Let's think about the love of God, he says. Look at verses 6 through 8 again. While we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. The ungodly, those who don't want what God wants. The, the selfish instead of the self-sacrificial like God is. One will hardly die for a righteous man. Perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. In other words, you would have to be, you'd have to have a real nice emotional attachment to someone to die in their place. But God, verse 8, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God did not wait until we were worthy to get started saving us. He started saving us when we were not worthy. That's his love. If he did that for us, why can we not believe that he will work in us even in our most difficult situations? That's his love. It's the same love. The same love in which Christ died for us is the same love at work in us in our tribulations. If we find it hard to believe that God is work, working in our most difficult situations, remember how he loved us in Christ dying for us. Also, it helps us to remember that God is not putting us through, God, God is not with us through any pain that he himself has not experienced. Uh, if you have been rejected, so has Christ. If you've been misunderstood, so has Jesus Christ. If you've been falsely accused, so has Jesus Christ. If you have suffered, so has Jesus Christ. If you're in physical pain, so was Jesus Christ. Uh, he is not putting, he, he is not with us through or, or, or going to put us in any situation that he himself has not experienced in Jesus. And he's also with us in our pain, which I believe means that he feels what we feel. He is with us in our pain. We are not like uh, the Greeks who believed that uh, the gods were, whatever humans were, the gods had to be the opposite of. So because humans were emotional and because humans um, felt pain, that the gods couldn't do any of that. I believe that, that when we weep, that God feels that too. Uh, I believe that when we rejoice, that God rejoices with us too. So it means that God is with us in our pain. We are not alone in whatever the di most difficult thing in our life is. God has abundantly proved his stance toward us. God has abundantly proved that his heart toward us is love, no matter what. That's who he is. That's why hope does not disappoint. Because the ground of our hope is in the infinite love of God. God has enough love to go around. And we have enough of his love to face anything that is coming up in our life. Hope does not disappoint does not mean, well, I hope everything works out. <laughs> That's not what Paul's talking about. It, it, it doesn't mean with that breaking voice, I hope this all works out. It means to say with full-throated confidence, no matter what happens, I know God is working in love in my life to make me like Jesus Christ. That's what we can say with confidence. That's what hope does not disappoint means because we know the love of God. He is forming in us a character consistent with Jesus Christ. How do we know we're getting there? How do we know that God is achieving what he is setting out to achieve in our life? This is one of my prized possessions. This little scrap of paper with crayon writing on it. Uh, when I was the pastor in Matador, Texas, uh, a gentleman named Jim Hancock came by. He was a former pastor in Matador, and he was on sort of a, a farewell tour. Um, he was, was up in years, and uh, before the Lord took him home, he had a goal of preaching at every church that he had ever pastored. He had pastored five different churches in his pastoral career. And he preached the same sermon at each of those five churches. And his sermon was from this text. God demonstrates his love toward us in this, that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. And so these are sermon notes taken by a child and written in crayon. This was, this was Jim Hancock's outline, the last sermon that he really ever planned to preach. Number one, God is love. That's who God is. That's why God's not going to run out, because he is love. Everything that he does is done from love. God is love. Number two, God loves me not just a general feeling of love for humanity that God has. He loves you specifically. He created you specifically, just the way you are. He created you. He loves you. He loves you. God is love. God loves me. And here's the kicker, all right? God wants me to love others the way he loves me. And then there's some stars <laughs> written in crayon. That's it. 
uh, I mean, simple enough for a child to understand, challenging enough to spend the rest of your life understanding this. God is love. God loves me, even in the midst of the most difficult thing in your life. God wants me to love other people the way he loves me. And the way you know that the love of God does not disappoint is because you see this happening more and more. Understand more and more the love of God. You start showing more and more of the love of God in your life. Our character, the people we are, is the stage on which we see the evidence of God's love, of what He has, what he has brought us through. Think about what he, God has brought you through in the past and see the evidence of the love of God. What we are becoming. Our character is the stage on which we play our part and show our love for God. And the, especially the way we show our love for God is by loving others. By the way, character is not, we, it's an individual responsibility, but clearly Paul intends it to be worked out in community. All the U's in this passage, the Y-O-U's, all the U's are plural. Uh, it's kind of hard to see in English. It should be y'all. <laughs> God demonstrates his own love toward y'all. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Um, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts, plural, through the Holy Spirit who was given to us, plural. Uh, characters worked out in community. So what that means is uh, your, your private troubles are really not meant to be your private troubles if you're part of the body of Christ. We are commanded to bear one another's burdens. We're commanded to pray for one another. We're commanded to uh, help one another. We're commanded to weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. We're in this together, is what Paul is saying. Uh, to share our trials with one another so that we can hope for one another. Here's a, and I don't have time to get into all this, but um, there are some times when hope doesn't seem like it's available to you and you have to have somebody else hope for you until you can get to that point where you can hope again. Um, Hang on to that. <laughs> Sometimes when you can't, other people have to do it for you and believe for you. Uh, we hope for one another. We help one another persevere. That's one of the ways in which we'll see the love of God. We'll see it poured out in the hearts of our brothers and sisters in Christ as, they pour, as, they, as the love of God overflows out of them and, in, and onto us. And we will manifest the love of God as the love of God pours out onto us and it overflows on us and onto other people. The love of God is poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Brother, sister, there is enough of the love of God to see you through whatever it is that you are going through. There is enough love of God in this place. There are enough brothers and sisters who know the love of God to help you persevere through whatever it is that you are going through. And we're going to need you <laughs> to turn back around and help us persevere through whatever it is that we're going through. But there's enough to go around. But because God is love, it's not going to run out. There's plenty to go around. Open up, my challenge to you today is open it, whatever trouble that you are in today, open up your heart to him. Open up your heart to your brothers and sisters who bear his name and discover that there is love enough to give us perseverance. That there's love enough, to, love enough to transform our character, that there's love enough to give us hope. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. And thank you for this word. Help us to believe it, God. And I pray especially for these who are here today or those who are going to hear this message, God, who feel a heavy burden and feel, God, like it is impossible to exult in their tribulation. But I pray, God, that you would help them to see evidence of your spirit transforming their character, of your spirit teaching them how much you love them, and of the hope that we will become what you created us to be. Thank you, God, for the love that you demonstrated in Jesus Christ. Thank you for showing us who you are in Jesus. Heavenly Father, help us to love other people and show other people who you are by living like Jesus and loving like Jesus. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.